Hello, hello to all of you watching right now. Welcome to a brand new episode of Hot Topics. If you are not familiar with this web series, I got to catch you up to speed. So this is a web series where we like to talk that real talk. Like we like to get down and dirty to the nitty gritty. We like to talk about the things that we don't really say out loud or we kind of keep to the kitchen table with our close family and friends. We don't really put it out there. This is the web series where we do that. So we tend to focus on certain topics, right? We tend to focus on topics in education, topics uh, pertaining to employment, physical health, mental health. If you check out our other episodes, we have episodes on financial literacy and we talk about divorce. Uh, We talk about uh, surviving eye cancer, surviving breast cancer. So we we like to, we stay within a certain scope in terms of topics, but within that scope, we get down and dirty. And that's what this web series is all about. I'm not sure I said my name. My name is Gabrielle. There we go. (laughs) So let's get right to it. So the name of this episode is, I'm going to get my banner here, Living with a Disability Part 7. So obviously there's a part, there's parts one through six, right? So you can see those previous episodes on our video library, wherever you are watching this right now, whatever platform you are seeing this episode right now, check out our other episodes, our other videos and clips, and you will see the other parts. So we like to repeat topics here because we believe that there is multiple ways to see the same thing. And we encourage all of our viewers to look at different points of view, right? Or multiple experiences. Don't just look at the one experience, but look at multiple experiences and multiple points of view for the same thing. So that's why we like to repeat topics here. So I have a guest with me who is going to sit on the hot seat. Her name is Inger Shea cozy and I can't wait to tell you about her. So let's get to it. Who is Inger Shea Cozy? Let me tell you who she is. So Inger Shea Cozy is an ADHD coach and psychotherapist specializing in making a difference for Black women executives and entrepreneurs, supporting women through clarity, empowerment, and resilience. She has successfully run her practice, alchemy coaching and counseling as a therapist and licensed clinical social worker for 15 years in spite of being undiagnosed until her 50s. She offers the benefits of professional expertise with a lifetime of experience. Inger Shea saw the need to create a space for professional Black women with ADHD on Facebook to fellowship, share, and learn from one another. She was a guest speaker on YouTube, How to ADHD, and the Stanford University Neurodiversity Project, among among others. She has also led multiple workshops for Black women with ADHD. Inger Shea's experiences include NLP practitioner, level two brain spotting practitioner, ADDA member and volunteer, Philadelphia CHADD Executive Committee member, founder National Association of Black ADHD Coaches, and C-Suite Executive Coach for a multi-million dollar company. That is a lot of letters. (laughs) So contact her today for a free consultation at ingershe at ingershe.com, which I will uh, provide her contact information at the end of this episode. All right. So without further ado, I'm going to bring her to the stage. Hi, Inger Shea. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I am well. Thank you for joining me on the hot seat. Okay. And as a, a quick reminder to anyone watching this in real time, 
I encourage you to ask your questions and leave your comments and um, definitely put them in the chat and I will uh, put them on the screen and we will uh, we'll do our best to answer your questions and comments. So definitely uh, participate in this episode. This is an interactive episode. All right, Ingoshe, I'm bringing it back to you now. So I uh, definitely um, want to hear about your experience living with ADHD, you know, being a Black woman with ADHD. I definitely want uh, you to share your experience. And I look forward to, to hearing what uh, you have to say. I look forward to what uh, all of us, I think, look forward to what you have to say. Uh, so I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to pass over the baton to you. Oh, great. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, it's really, I'm excited to be here uh, and talk about this because it's really an important topic, ADHD, and especially the intersectionality of, of ADHD uh, being a woman and uh, being a black woman. So I'm just quickly going to tell you my story, if I can be quick. To think is not always my strong suit. That's kind of part of my ADHD. But, you know, I look back and I was the kid that, you know, they said was so smart, but, you know, you're not living up to your potential. When I was a little kid and I was going into school, my mother decided to have me take a test so I could skip and not go to kindergarten. And they didn't want me to take this test because we had moved, I live right outside of Philadelphia and we had moved from Philadelphia to the suburbs. And they were like, no one's ever passed this test, especially a child that looks like yours. So my mother said, just let her take it. And if she passes it, great. If she doesn't, she'll just start when everybody else does. So that, not only did I pass the test, I passed it and I remembered all the questions. So my school life began with somebody that was just that smart. But as we moved further up in school, where we started to change classes and you had to turn in your own papers and learning the ins and outs of uh, friendships, things got a lot harder. I was able to graduate from high school and I was accepted to college. I went to Virginia State University and HBCU. So shout out to VSU. Um, and it was great because I was able to really be with black people that could understand me because I grew up in a white high school. But once I got there and started to get acclimated, it became apparent that without any structure, I didn't know what I was doing. So I look back and it took me eight years. And I mean, eight straight years to get out of college, no breaks. Uh, I went in summer and it was just very, difficult but i think about the ways that i was able to manage my adhd so at that time i didn't know i had adhd um it was a thing that they didn't talk about at least not around me that that was even something that was something that existed it was more that you just need to kind of figure the stuff out and pick yourself up by your bootstraps so at about the fourth fifth year mark my father was like what are you doing here you need to come home I was like, I don't want to come home. You know, I want to be able to finish. And he was like, well, you have one more semester or you're going to come home. And that deadline helped kick me into gear. And I started to figure out what did I need to do to get through college? So I knew I did, I couldn't type. So I would write a paper and I'm old enough that it was a typewriter that we were using, but I would write my paper and take it to my girlfriend and ask her to type it. And because I was always like just running up against the deadline, I might bring it to her a few hours before it was due. She would not be happy, but she would type it for me because they were judging me on the paper. They weren't judging me on the typing. Um, I would find the smartest people in a class and have a study group. Like I create a study group because I knew that I was the type of learner that I needed other people around to be able to pick up on the information. And then I went to class because that was something I had been missing. Uh, when I'm there and I can hear the information, I can retain it. So I didn't even know about being an auditory learner. Uh, I also had the experience of having one of my teachers pull me aside because I had a class where you needed to dress a certain way, wear a white coat and certain shoes and cover your hair. And I didn't want to do that. 
And I took the class like three times and dropped it. And as I was saying it the fourth time, the professor who was a black woman pulled me aside because I came with my regular clothes. And she said, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? She's like, you know, you have to pass this class. And she's like, you're not gonna pass it until you do what you're, you need to do. And I see so much in you and I don't know why you can be so stubborn. And it occurred to me that maybe if I just listened and did what they asked, I would get out. And I know that woman didn't really care for me, which was fine. But what she did care for, as you saw a black woman struggling, and she pulled me by my coattail and said, hey, this is what you need to do. At that time, I didn't know that that kind of stubborn streak also comes with ADHD. Fast forward through uh, graduating from college, many, many jobs that I lost because I can't tell time. <laughs> Being on time is like really difficult. Um, and I decided to work in a salon because I was going to go to law school, but by then my parents had spent enough money on college. And uh, if I was going to go to law school, I had to pay for it. So I decided to work in a salon so I could have my own hours. Well, I decided I loved the salon. It was where I needed to be. I was a lot of interaction, a lot of different people. I got to do different things. And I really thrived there. But it was hard for other people to understand why I would want to work there when I had a college degree. And I was fine with it. And I didn't realize all those different interactions kept my brain going. When we're interested in stuff, it's so easy to do things. When we're not, not so much. But I decided later on to go to school to be a therapist because I spoke so much while I was at the salon. Uh, at that same time when I got accepted to graduate school, uh, which was not an easy feat with the grades that I had after eight years, I got pregnant and I that this was not the plan of my husband and I, but I was able to either be pregnant with a newborn and go through grad school and graduate on time. So nothing like uh, a deadline to, to help get some things done. Uh, I became a therapist and it wasn't until my son in about fifth grade, uh, the teachers were like, we think he should get tested. Um, you know, we, they couldn't quite figure out what was going on. He too sometimes would get an A, sometimes would get an F, but always would be talking to everybody else in the class. So he was diagnosed that summer. And then when I got the rating scales, they give you scales like uh, to rate for your child. So I checked them all off. I was like, this one's me, this one's me. It's like, oh my goodness, they're all me. So I was like, okay, I'm not surprised. But what was surprising is that when you go to school, at least when I went to school, this was quite a bit ago. Um, they only talked about ADHD in the realm of little white boys that fell out of their chairs because that's where the research was. The ones that were running around easily diagnosed. There was not really a lot of talk about uh, people who were what you call inattentive type ADHD. There's three types of ADHD. There's the hyperactive, which is what you would like to say, normally see, or what you would think about as ADHD. Uh, and then inattentive is where if somebody's spacey, dreamy, if somebody kind of seems like they're just kind of going with the flow and but they're not quite getting it, that would be more of like an uh, inattentive type presentation. And then there's one where it's combined. So a little bit of each. Oh, many times for women, the inattentive type begins missed because women are taught to be, you know, the girls, it starts from girls, to be quiet, go with the flow figure this out, figure out what you need to do about things. And if you're not upsetting the apple cart, then people think there's nothing wrong with you. And that hyperactive part turns inward and turns to anxiety. There's a lot of anxiety that goes with ADHD. Um, that with ADHD rarely runs alone. It, it usually has something that goes with it. Um, call it I, I would still call it comorbid because people can kind of understand when the condi two conditions go together. So, it was just interesting that it wasn't until my son got diagnosed and I, you know, I was living my life, taking care of him, making sure he was okay. Cause it was a, a lot to handle a little black boy in a white school that in my fifties, I started losing my words one day when I would think of words and it wouldn't come out. And I was like, Oh crap, I'm a therapist. Like I talk all day. 
am I having early onset Alzheimer's? But I remember reading like one thing about ADHD affecting women during menopause. And I was able to find someone to diagnose me. I had to drive an hour and a half each way, but I was, I'm one of the lucky ones. Sometimes diagnosis is a privilege. And that's when I was able to like treat my ADHD and know what it was, know what it wasn't. Uh, and then starting to learn how to able to manage it because many people when they get diagnosed, especially later in life, they really feel sad. They're like, what could it have been if I had known I was, like, you know, my ADHD brain loves to figure out a problem. And now that I know what the problem is, I can figure it out. And that really propelled me into ADHD coaching, which at the time I didn't even, even know was something that uh, was around. And they had a big conference here in Philly in 2019. And I was part of her presentation. I was a coachee for a coach. Um, and when I went to the big conference, of which it was the first time I went, I noticed there were no people, very few people of color, period, but very few black people. And I was asking around, like, do people, black people not know about it? Do they not feel comfortable? And what I came to find is that there aren't as many black people in coaching uh, for ADHD, but there are a lot of people who are being diagnosed. And I decided to ha make a foundation, um, an association so that black coaches could come together and fellowship and share ideas and if you want a coach that looks like you because uh, for many people they really just want to be around people that look like them because you know we have a certain shorthand that we have to do and sometimes you're just surrounded by uh, providers that don't look like you i decided to have an association where people could come and find somebody that looks like them if that's what they want um, to be able to help them and you know, flash forward, here we are to now. <laughs> um, it's been a fantastic ride and time. It's really important that people know that ADHD is a real condition, a real diagnosable condition. It's been around in the book since about the 1700s um, that there are things you can do to be able to manage it. And when you manage it and lean it to your strength, you can really have a really great life. Uh, I know it's like, it's funny. I saw you put up where it's like living with disability and ADHD is a brain-based condition. Um, it's that you don't quite get enough dopamine, you know, and it's, it's a short way to explain it. And that's why um, people pick, you know, stimulant medication, not just stimulants, but a certain stimulant medication to be able to increase your dopamine. And it's interesting because I know it's in the DSM, but I don't really consider it a disability. I, and I don't consider it a superpower. There's like a whole debate about that. I just consider it like part of who I am. Like my eyes are brown and, you know, I have size eight shoes because I have ADHD and I just live my life that way and do the things that really work for me and just kind of shore up the parts that are holding me back. And that's just really been helpful for me and helpful for the people that I help, all of my clients. So I hope that was succinct enough. <laughs> like I said, being succinct is not uh, one of my superpowers. That is okay. Feel free to, you know, to ramble on. So you, you know, you, you mentioned um, a lot about, uh, a lot about race and um, it, it, it seems like there were, or I guess I got the sense that maybe you were you were treated differently because because you're a black woman or you felt that there wasn't enough resources in terms of ADHD. Could you clarify that a little bit? Sure, absolutely. So uh, as I when I was younger, it wasn't even something that I knew about. And I feel like there's a lot of people didn't know about it back then. Um, as I said, I'm in my 50s. Uh, even I do have some colleagues that are white that were diagnosed early. What I feel about it is that just being a black woman, there's a lot that comes with that, right? You know, we're already marginalized. We're always in spaces where they either think that we are super women, we could do it all, or when something doesn't happen, it's like we didn't think you could do it anyway. Um, the expectations that come with being a woman and a black woman of 
managing your household, managing all your finances, remembering all the birthdays, cooking all the big dinners, keeping everybody together. And ADHD is a condition, is uh, an executive functioning condition. So our executive functioning, which is kind of like the manager in your brain, uh, it needs to work a lot harder to get those things done. So organization, prioritization, um, time management, uh, sometimes they say motivation, things like that are uh, the parts of your brain that ADHD, uh, ADHD isn't really working as well in your executive functioning. And those are the parts that people expect you to do. So an example is if I'm a black woman and I come late to work, you know, it's that oh, we black people, you know, you, you're on CP time and that can be a problem versus I've been working really hard to try to be there on time. I just maybe not understand that, that concept of time. It's not something that uh, I've been able to kind of manage. So, you know, you're walking in with those biases. And then if you're the woman and you're going into work and maybe everybody's bringing something for somebody's birthday and you're like, oh my goodness, I forgot because working memory too is part of executive functioning. Having to be able to manage that and the, all the emotions that go with it too. Um, the bias, the microaggressions, and then the emotions that can come with it from outside people or even your family. Because many families don't believe in any type of mental health or mental health care. Uh, and for many people, it's unfortunate, but their families will say, it's not real. It's a character flaw. You're lazy, you're crazy, you're stupid, you're the spacey one. And having to deal with the emotions that go with that. So that emotional management uh, really does also affect your ADHD. Because shame is a terrible thing and shame kills. So I guess that, I hope that explains it a little bit better. Of course, of course. So is a lot of things all at once, right? So it's... Um it's the the black stereotype of of appearing lazy and and not caring when it's when it's an executive functioning thing it's a it's a processing thing and then it's a it's a gender thing um in in terms of like you know women are i see i think it's it, <clears throat> as a posit, the positive stereotypes and like oh women are supposed to be the smart ones and the organized ones, and they're supposed to do it all. Um, and, you know, not, and not all, you know, women are like that. Um, and then you brought up the, another part, which is the family life and how they view, um, how they view learning disabilities and how they view, um, I mean, mental health as well. So it's also things with Black people and mental health and then also with, with learning disabilities. So it sounds it sounds like everything is, is against us Black ladies. <laughs> is, is, is that fair to say? Um, you know, I'm not here to say like everything is against us because, <laughs> you know, that type of thought process, you know, is not helpful. I think that there are, are things that we definitely have to take care of and manage. I think that, you know, the awareness of like, you know, you're mentioning kind of that superwoman trope, like, so it's been put out there that we can do all things like, you know, black superwoman, uh, even the, a little bit of like more for other people like black excellence where, excuse me, as you mentioned, like it's not a, a matter of somebody's intelligence. Um, you're just as intelligent, if not sometimes more intelligent than other people. It's more of a function of when you're doing things differently than the way that other people do it. And those thoughts and perceptions are then put on you that what you're doing is wrong or it doesn't go with the norm, that then they put it on you as a character assassination. So, you know, we all... Uh, I'm sure you know about like you've been places where there's microaggressions. It's just, you know, sometimes they mean it, sometimes they don't. You know, it's, if you step on my foot, even though you don't know, it still hurts. Uh, there's bias, which, you know, 
when people, when you walk in our shoes, having bias against us is something that, you know, we just do, we're used to it. It's, you know, I wake up every day as a black woman. I wake up every day as a uh, black woman with ADHD. The thing is, you can see my blackness. You can see I'm a woman. You can't see that I have ADHD until you see it. So it's more invisible. And that sometimes is very confusing to other people as it can be very confusing to us, especially if you don't know about it, where you've gotten a lot of really bad information about it. That happens a lot. So that's part of the reason why I like to come out and speak so you can get some real clear information, questions answered, and to know that you can live well with ADHD. Can you give an example of, of such bad information that someone might receive? So, yes, it's interesting. And I don't, it's, it's a web series. So I, I don't want to put it on any other platforms that are out there. But, you know, a lot of social media, there's no vetting process. So people that are out there, you don't know what they're saying. You don't know what's true and what's not true. I uh, TikTok, you know, I mean, people are like, I got diagnosed there. Well, okay. But you didn't get actually diagnosed by like a clinician or something. And sometimes uh, people will just think that, like ADHD is like just little, you know, little white boys falling out of their chairs because that's where most of the research is. When you don't look at things like the inattentive type, um, then, and there's not much research on it, especially for women. Uh, there's very little research on women over 50 and how menopause affects your ADHD. Again, that's how I ended up actually going for an official diagnosis because when I started losing my words, it was scary. I thought I had early onset Alzheimer's. And I was like, oh my goodness, what am I gonna do? And it wasn't until I thought about, you know, they say if you remember what a key is, then you don't have Alzheimer's. If you lose your keys, if you lose your keys, you don't have Alzheimer's. You don't remember the key is, then you do. That I was able to luckily get diagnosed. So it's just going out there and knowing the information that it's real, because many people don't think it's real because it's a little different for each person that it's something that you can treat um you don't and you don't necessarily have to you take medication that's your choice there are other things that you can do um where i feel that medication is probably the the i shouldn't say the best but the the first thing that you know they're offered but exercise sleep some vitamins uh minerals you know they're coming up with a few things that could be helpful um ADHD coaching, as I do, so to be able to manage uh, the way that your ADHD pre present, present, present itself, and um, also the emotional management that goes with it. Because with ADHD, there are, um, I call it the feels. Some people have what they call rejection sensitive dysphoria, which is not in the DSM. But emotional management goes with impulsivity, which is all a part of your executive functioning. And many times when, you know, maybe somebody didn't text you back or you thought you text them and you didn't press send or they didn't get back to you, you can feel like, oh, my goodness, they, they don't like me. Like they must be a problem. Um, or sometimes there's a communication problem and where you're not. Some people have trouble reading the room. Um, because of different ways of communicating with neurotypicals and people who are neurodiverse. Uh, those things, you know, can be perceived in ways that aren't helpful. So when you have good information and knowing that, hey, if I'm not necessarily looking at you in the eye, it's just because it's easier for me to concentrate when I don't do that. We're sitting here talking, I have a fidget in my hand. Because if I have this in my hand, it helps to keep me a little more grounded. You know, it, it's no different. When I used to doodle in school or in church, and they'd be like, stop doing that. Little did I know the doodling helped to keep me really interested in the subject and it helped me to then have a way to remember it. Because that process of writing it out is now, you know, we hear about that. It helps to put it into your brain versus even now like typing it out. But, you know, when people have misinformation about these things, it looks like I don't care if I'm doing it. Like I don't care if I'm looking away. It looks like I don't care if my desk is messy. But out of sight, out of mind, we have poor working memory. So 
that doesn't mean I can't handle a project. It just means that I have some extra stuff on my desk so I remember what to do. It's like organized chaos. Is that what it sounds like? Uh, a little bit of that. Um, it's just like, I don't organize, I'm sure as you organize. You know, we're divergent thinkers. We're big thinking people. Like we are the people that have really big ideas. Uh, and then bringing them to fruition sometimes is hard because filling in those little gaps of, you know, maybe meeting the deadlines on time or um, getting to uh, like open all your emails on time, um, getting together and getting a team organized uh, in a way that works for you. So, you know, a lot of what I do is allowing people to have their process and be okay with their process and not try to do the process that what they call normal people do because it's not how your brain works. At the end of the day, as long as you get it done, it doesn't matter. Um, and not to really take on the thoughts of other people when they see you doing it in a way that doesn't work for them. Um, it's funny, I have, all my friends are, are neuro, neurotypical and I was starting um, a program. I, a few times a year, run a group coaching program and a friend of mine was helping me and she was like, we have to have all these things in place first. We have to have this, we have to have that. And I was like, no, we don't. And she's like, yeah, we have to have this. And I was like, no, we don't. I was like, the people have a place to come and the people have a place to, you know, fellowship with and the people have a place to pay. That's all I need to be able to start the program, you know, making sure every sheet, like worksheet and things like that were done before we started would mean that I would never get it started because it's easier for me to do the worksheets and things or like film a video before, like right before. Because also I'll have more information about what's going on with people. So, you know, it's interesting as it was my program, but my friend who loves me dearly, the way she organizes is to have everything and then do it. The way my brain organizes is like have enough to, keep, to get started and then it'll all fill in and it all gets done on time and it'll be way better than if I did something ahead of time that I'm not quite sure what people wanted. We work better when we know what people, what you are expected to do and to know what done is. Because sometimes when there's not like specific uh, instructions and you don't know what done is, many people with ADHD will overdo or under uh, perform. And the, if you overdo, it sounds great, but that leads to burnout. Um, because that's a lot of extra work and a lot of extra worrying that you're not doing what someone's asked. Right. So it's, it's, you know, someone with, um, someone with ADHD may, um, find themselves taking on too many things when, when it's not necessary. Yes, or not theirs. <laughs> There's that boundary management too. So when somebody asks you to do like to do something, do what they ask. Not always like if you're not sure that you're going to do extra things because uh, that sounds great. But really, you only have to do what's asked. Um, and having boundaries of not taking on other people's projects or things that you don't want or things that you don't need to do or things that don't align with your values like that can happen pretty easily where the next thing you know, like everybody, could you do this? Could you do that? Could you do this? Could you do that? And you just go, yes, 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 I can. And never really checking with yourself or checking in with your calendar or uh, thinking about how long it's going to take to do these extra projects that aren't yours. And really sometimes not knowing what they are. And when you look up something that doesn't even align with your values, it's like, this is something I would never do. Um, and not having the language to tell people no, right? Not to say, well, sorry, no, not this time I can't, or this your project is like so important, but I just really can't fit it on my plate, maybe next time. You know, it, it's something where sometimes we'll just take on a lot of stuff because we're not considering it. It's kind of an impulse to say yes, or not being able to figure out managing the time properly when you say yes. And we can be pretty empathetic so saying yes. And then, like I said, then we can't get those projects done, let alone the projects we're supposed to do. And then there's a problem. So, you know, working with these things, this is what I, what I do, and uh, especially with women, because then we always 
you know, feel like we need to do a little bit more, especially black women, because most of the time, as I said, you walk through the door and they're not expecting you to do anything anyway. Right. So, you know, you feel like maybe I need to do extra so that they can notice me or they can see that I can do the job. And again, that learns leads to a lot of burnout and, you know, burnout is real when you're trying to, you know, work. And if you have kids, ADHD is highly heritable. So you, if you have ADHD, you probably have a kid with ADHD and that's a lot to manage because school is not set up for people with ADHD. And, you know, you have family, uh, friends, other obligations, you know, if you want to be civic minded and do volunteer things or like work with a church or whatever, taking all, all those things, um, it becomes really too much for women and they feel then they feel shame when they can't get these things done and not wanting to ask for help. Um, you know, it can just really all fall apart pretty quickly. Uh, I tell my story all the time. Like I was working like three jobs and I had my son and I had my friends and I had family. And I always say, it was like, I feel like I was juggling everything. And then I was juggling on a unicycle and I was juggling on a unicycle. And then what I was juggling was like chainsaws on fire and a hamster wheel. And it was like the hamster wheel from hell. And I couldn't figure out how to get off. If I dropped something, everything would fall apart. But if I didn't drop something, I was going to fall apart. And neither one of those were an option. So to be able to start managing the parts of my ADHD allowed me to figure out what was mine, what wasn't mine and what I didn't even have to worry about and being okay with dropping some things. And that happens sometimes and not judging myself or allow other people's judgments to affect me. So basically you, well, not basically, but um, it, so it sounds like you don't let those societal pressures get to you. You don't, let those the pressures from your family get to you or from <clears throat> um, the people from your workplace get to you or the you know the pressure of being a black woman get to you or um the pressure of being a black person get to you so it sounds like you're aware of all of those pressures around you but you 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 remain centered and you you remain you remember what you're trying to go for and you remember the goal that you're trying to accomplish and you're aware of your processing issues and you're aware that it is an issue and not a burden a, a curse uh you know it's not the devil taking you down you know it's you know it's uh it's an actual physical thing that's happening in your brain so being aware of all those things allows you to um allows you to handle all of those all of the societal pressures well uh, no but like yes and no yes i'm aware of these things yes i really work with these things but but i it be real like i'm not superhuman i'm not so superhuman. Yeah. like i've got this all figured out no way no way you know, it's something I'm working with every day. You know, it, it is a chronic condition. It's not going anywhere. I'm born with it. Um, so I'm going to die with it. And I have to manage it every day, all day. And, you know, that's the truth. And some days it's great. And some days it's really hard. What I've really learned to do is have self-compassion. That's what it is. So on the days that it's great, I'm like, this is great. The days it's hard, I'm like, this is, you know, nothing was happening today. You know, there's this uh, phrase, some days you're the bird, some days you're the statue. Sometimes I'm like, I have statue days. Like, this is it, you know, but having self-compassion that I'm a human being and I'm doing the best I can. And, you know, there's always, you know, tomorrow or the next hour or you can apologize or, you know, fix things you need to fix like everybody else. Just allows me a little, some freedom inside of that being a human because I'm just human like everybody else. Right. You're not, you're not superwoman. You're just a regular, a regular person. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's funny because I do speak about this stuff all the time and I never wanted to feel like, seem like, Oh, you just got all together. Like, what about me? 
it's that, you know, I just decided too, like, it's not a struggle like that. It's not, go- it's not gonna be a struggle. It's gonna be just something that I have to manage. It's a challenge. I need to do things about it uh, using a coaching model. Like, so I'm a coach. So it's like, what's the opportunity here? <laughs> That's like coach speak where it's like, okay, this is what's happening. What am I gonna do about it? Like what's gonna be the answer to it? That's what I like mostly about what we call late stage diagnosis. Um, when you're diagnosed in school, that's the normal time that they would figure you get diagnosed, even though I know so many women who have been diagnosed uh, from like, you know, out of school would be like 19. To many women like me who are diagnosed when menopause comes, because for women, uh, many times they're diagnosed when their kids are diagnosed, because like me, they get these scales and they see it's them. Uh, with girls, it, with your hormones, when they, you know, get their period, um, sometimes during your childbearing years, when if uh, you can see like maybe like a week or two before it's like you seem a little out of it i remember i could not park the week before so like my depth perception would just leave and i never knew why um those times people get diagnosed many women got diagnosed with the pandemic because all of the structures they were using to stay on schedule and have a good life all went away and you came home and you were sitting home trying to teach some kids and sitting in front of a screen all day um and not having the outlets that you had really let them know that they were managing something beyond what they thought. Uh, and then other, a lot of women like myself get diagnosed at when they have menopause because my story of losing my words is common, far more common than uh, you would expect. And those are the ways that people are able to take care of themselves. So for me, when I look back, I was able to take care of myself because I had to figure some stuff out, right? Everything's figure outable for me, at least that's the way I feel, because I had to do that. I had to think on my feet, I had to be quick. I had to, you know, fix things that weren't great, um, learn to kind of accept things that I wasn't doing well, and then put myself in spaces that worked for me. Um, so I worked at the salon until recently, or just on Saturdays, because I still really liked it. Not that I had to. Um, I've worked for my, I've had my own business for, my God, longer. I got to change my bio. It's not longer than 15 years now. Um, uh, ra- you know, raising a son, he has finished, he's gotten all his credits for high school before graduation. And that, that's a feat in itself. Like, uh, I love him and, you know, getting through that finish line. So there's a lot that we all do and we can do. And not being not feeling that you can't do it because there's like a lot of slip ups that went on on the way but i can't i don't take them as the norm and also i don't take it as that i'm the one that's always wrong like i think this is the important thing to say i'm glad you brought it up many times people adhd feel like they're the one who's wrong because the people in our typical like well why are you doing it that way or what you're doing is wrong you shouldn't do that that way or that doesn't make sense that's a it's a big one <laughs> came out of my house. It doesn't make sense. Like, what are you doing? Where it's like, no, maybe what I'm doing makes perfect sense for me. <laughs> it makes sense for you. So when you realize you're not the, you know, you're not the problem that, you know, you're allowed to do it your way. And, you know, the other people, they do things correct and incorrect also. Um, having that mindset has really got me through a lot because you know, it's not like it's just me. It's not like a one down perspective. Like I have to be the bad guy or the person that's wrong. It's that we're all human. We all do stuff great and we all do stuff that's bad. And <laughs> coming to the middle where let's like figure some things out. And that's really the big reason why I speak because so many people with ADHD, especially women, the shame is palpable. And the shame, I mean, it really it does, There, you know, if we talk about mental health in the black community, that's my biggest goal. I mean, the rate of suicide is, you know, off the chain. Uh, and, you know, I live in Philadelphia, so there's a lot of crime, um, you know, homicides, and it, it breaks my heart. And when we can address it and people can have, A, awareness, you know, and it's okay to say you're struggling, be things to do about it uh, and take care of it and know it's not just you.
because all women, all of the women that come to me, and I mean all of them, the reason why they come to me is they go, oh my God, I saw you and I thought it was just me. I thought I was the only one that had that. And it's like, no, there's lots of us. So I invite them to my Facebook group with over a thousand women that have the same thing. <laughs> And it's really comforting and healing when you see that it's not just you. That this is something that happens more frequently than you would know. And there are ways to be able, like I said, to manage it and manage your emotions and feel like you're a part of a community. You're not ostracized. You're not left out. There's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> you just have some things to manage. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. All right, so we are winding down now. So do you have any final advice that you'd like to share with our viewers or any final words of wisdom that you'd like to share? Well, first, I'd like to thank you so much for having me on. This has been fun. Um, I just really like to share that, you know, again, ADHD is real. It is a real condition. It's not made up. It's not something you're just like using as an excuse. It's a real condition. You can get diagnosed and I suggest you try to get a diagnosis. Sometimes it's easier said than done for people, but keep trying. Um, if you go to a clinician and they're like, no, you have anxiety or just depression, you feel like that's wrong, um, keep going and find someone that can help you. Um, and, you know, you can live well with ADHD. You can do all sorts of things, whatever it is that you like. Uh, run so many people run businesses and have families and do great things and have their ADHD and you know not have it be the be all end all. Uh breaking that stigma of shame is really my big goal so that you know people can really live the life that they really want. Absolutely. And I think I just want to add this quick point that I also think as black people we need to, um, we need to, you know, not be afraid of, you know, going to doctors, going to a psychiatrist, going to a psychologist. I think that we as Black people need to normalize um, physical, normalize health <laughs> and uh, normalize um, mental health and um <clears throat> and normalize you know seeking a professional when you need help and to not um be don't be afraid to ask for help and don't be don't look at it at uh, as a thing of shame but you know something that should be a thing of pride because you're aware that you're um that you're in a in a weak state and you're looking to to change that so i think and even for black women, but also um, um, just Black people in general, I think that the more that we accept things like um, going to doctors to be evaluated for ADHD, the more that we accept, um, accept our flaws, acknowledge that we're not perfect, we're not super people, uh, you know, we're not superheroes, that we are human, um, the more that we embrace our flaws, then the more that we can acknowledge those flaws. And the more, the more people that do this, the more black people that do this, the, the more normal that all this will become. All right. So all righty then. So thank you so much, Inga Shea. And let me promote you. So to the viewers, all of her contact information is scrolling below on the screen. You can find her on Instagram and Twitter. You can also, uh, that Facebook group that we mentioned, it is right there. It's called Black Women with ADHD Executives and Entrepreneurs. So uh, type that in the, the Facebook search bar and it will pop up for you. Um, you can also learn about her coaching services on the website, which is also scrolling below on the screen, www.ingershay.com. It is her name, you know, her name is everywhere. <laughs> so there's no way that you can forget that. Um, 
So, so just briefly about your business. So you, you do private consultations or private coaching, right? Yes, I do. Um, private one-on-one coaching and I am starting a group. Um, I'm just trying to figure out the date, but, uh, next month I'm going to start a, a coaching group for black women. Um, so if you go to my website, um, and it'll be on my website or on my social. Uh, it's going to be next month, and a 12-week program where we go over ADHD and how to manage it and work, you know, especially in business as a professional, as like I work with C-suite executives, um, you know, or an entrepreneur. As I am an entrepreneur, and I know many of them with ADHD. Awesome. You, you heard it there. You know, she provides one-on-one coaching so if if you have been diagnosed with with ADHD or maybe you suspect that you have it after listening to this episode and maybe you're thinking, hey, you know, I have some of those things, you know, definitely um, reach out to, to Ingrashe as well. And of course, as a general note, um, we do encourage you to, if you suspect that you have these symptoms after listening to our episode today, we um, encourage you to to get yourself evaluated. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you can go see your doctor or go see a, I think, a neuropsychologist. Um, so we definitely encourage you to to get yourself evaluated and get yourself diagnosed, as Inger Shea, as Inger Shea said. Um, but yes, but she is available for coaching. So definitely reach out to her. All of her contact information is scrolling at the bottom of the screen. And I hope that you guys take advantage of this, you know, and especially the black women definitely, you know, reach out to her. I encourage you to take advantage of those services. All right, Ingrashay, thank you so much for joining me today. This was an amazing, an amazing interview. Now, thank you so much. Again, it was like so much fun. And I'm really, I appreciate you having me on talking about this really important topic. Of course. All right. I'm going to place you backstage right now. And it is just you and me, guys. I'm just going to pull up my banner. All right. Yes. Just give me one second. All right. We have reached the conclusion of our episode. Thank you so much for joining us today. So wherever you are watching this episode right now, whatever platform that you are watching this episode, check out our check out our video library in that platform for more videos and clips. And don't forget to follow us. So whatever that button is, if it's like, follow, subscribe, uh, tweet, uh, whatever that button is, I encourage you to press that button and stay in touch with us. And while you're at it, let us know what you thought about this episode by leaving a comment in the comment section below or in the comment thread. I definitely want to hear your feedback about this episode. And as a reminder, this web series is a production of A Step Ahead Tutoring Services. If you would like to learn more about our company our services, our workshops, the things that we have to offer. If you are looking for tutoring for your child or even for yourself, because we do take um, adult students, college students, if you are looking for that one-on-one -on -one tutoring, please reach out to us. Our contact information is scrolling below. We are on our social media, as you see, and our website as well, which I will just say, it is www.stepaheadtutoringservices.com. And I want to make sure I get this. I encourage you to join our email list and or our texting list. Those links are also scrolling below. So if you join those lists, you will hear about our special offers, our promotions, our events. You will definitely get that a VIP treatment. <laughs> so you will know about things before, you know, everyone else does. So I encourage you to subscribe to our email list, our texting list, or both. The links to subscribe are, are scrolling below on the screen and the links will, all of this will be provided in the description as well. 
particularly on uh, on YouTube. Okay, and I'm just gonna share this final message before we officially close. Hey there, have you heard of us? We're a small team of tutors here at A Step Ahead Tutoring Services. We believe that education and information should be accessible to everyone, regardless of income, race, or creed. We're dedicated to making this happen, but we need your help. Please consider making a donation to our company. No amount is too small. Your donation will allow us tutors to remain employed, offer free and low-cost services, put on productions like this web series, and reach out to families nationwide. With your help, we can tackle the academic challenges of our students and the emotional, mental, and behavioral changes that result from these challenges. As a bonus, we can improve our communities in the process. Support us today. Note, we're a for-profit company. We're not a charity. Your donation may not be tax deductible. Please consult a tax professional. All right. Well, thank you for watching this episode. Thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to seeing you at the next episode. Thank you again. And now I'm signing off.